Hello. The following presentation is based upon a talk given by Ted Sawyer, Director of Research and Education for Bullseye Glass Company. The talk, presented at BCon 2009, is entitled Stress Out, Avoiding Painful Breaks and Strains, and focuses on the theory and process of getting the stress out of fused glass work, and hopefully, thereby removing some of the stress of studio practice. There are several major reasons that a piece of glass might break in kiln forming practice. For the thicker works typical of kiln casting, the area of perhaps greatest concern and misunderstanding is that of annealing. What is annealing? As glass cools, it contracts. More specifically, the exterior surfaces contract towards the hotter interior. This contraction is a form of strain, and this strain causes stress to develop. As long as the glass is cooling, the exterior surface will always be applying strain to the interior and causing stress. The trick to preventing the stress from becoming too great is to cool as uniformly as possible in the region known as the annealing range, where the glass is transitioning from behaving like a plastic material to behaving like an elastic material. Above these temperatures, the glass is capable of plastic deformation, and any stress that develops as a result of the strain of cooling and contraction will be relieved almost immediately. Below this range, any stress that develops as a result of cooling will disappear once the glass reaches equilibrium at room temperature, assuming that the glass is not cooled so rapidly that it thermal shocks. How has the annealing of glass evolved? Obviously, people have been successfully annealing glass, at least glass of limited thicknesses, for thousands of years. They did so by finding practical or commercially viable methods. In other words, they did what worked. For example, in industries with a single shift of work per day, this involved finding a temperature at which the glass could be held in the annealing oven for a period of time, after which the oven was simply shut off and allowed to cool at its natural rate. This left the oven ready to be unloaded, reheated, and reloaded for the following day's production. Glass annealed in this fashion would have been subjected to appropriate practical testing to ensure that it was properly annealed. Eventually, photoelasticity tests using polarized light to view stress were developed, and these became a standard method for reviewing glass. In the early 1900s, a series of tests and observations were done that identified several points in the behavior of glass, most notably for our purposes, the annealing point and the strain point for a specific test glass. At the annealing point, stress was relieved from the test glass in 15 minutes. At the strain point, stress was relieved from the test glass in four hours. In other words, at the strain point, it takes 16 times as long to remove stress as it does at the annealing point. Further testing, which has since been standardized as ASTM C336, identified the viscosity of this test glass at these temperatures. Since that time, these viscosities have been used to define the annealing point and strain point of commercial glasses. This means that these points correspond with specific temperatures for any given glass when tested according to the methods described in the ASTM procedure. Since people often fixate so much on the annealing point and strain point, I thought I'd give you a brief glimpse of how they are determined. A 0.65 millimeter diameter thread of test glass is suspended in a furnace chamber with a one kilogram weight affixed to its bottom end. It is then heated at a rate of five degrees Celsius per minute. After the thread begins to elongate at a rate of 0.6 millimeters per minute, the heating is stopped. The furnace is then cooled at a rate of roughly four degrees Celsius per minute. When the thread's rate of elongation has slowed to roughly 0.14 millimeters per minute, it is at the viscosity of the annealing point, and the correlating temperature is recorded. As it continues to cool, it reaches the point at which the rate of elongation slows to roughly 0.0044 millimeters per minute, which is the viscosity of the strain point, and again, the correlating temperature is recorded. It is important to note that the manner in which the glass is treated to find these points differs considerably from how we fire the glass in the studio practices of kiln casting, in which we are typically cooling from a process temperature to the annealing range, and the piece of glass that we are cooling is much larger than a thin thread, and that piece of glass is furthermore usually within a refractory mold. Having said that, the next step in the evolution of annealing was to develop and refine annealing charts using these points. 
One such chart, shown in McClelland and Shan's Glass Engineering Handbook, suggests heating to 5 degrees Celsius above the annealing point, holding for a time that increases with the thickness of the glass, and then cooling at a rate that decreases with the thickness of the glass to a temperature below the strain point that becomes lower as the thickness of the glass increases. Actual values for determining the rates and temperatures are available in the text. The chart also provides for different rates and soak times, depending on whether the glass is being cooled from one side or from two sides. You may already be familiar with Bullseye's annealing chart, which is largely based on the methods presented in McClelland and Shand. The idea is that using this chart will allow one to cool the glass uniformly, or in such a manner that the temperature difference, sometimes referred to as the delta T, throughout the piece of glass will be less than 10 degrees Fahrenheit, 5 degrees Celsius. As the explanatory text at the top of the chart makes clear, the cycles are based on a flat slab of uniform thickness that is set up in such a fashion that it can cool equally from top and bottom. What this means for us is that we need to think not only about the expected thickness or thicknesses of the finished piece of glass, but also how it is set up in the kiln. Are there a lot of insulating material surrounding it or under it? Everything that goes into the firing chamber with the glass may impact how uniformly it may cool. Obviously then, in kiln casting we often have a relatively complex problem. If we go back to our list, this brings us to the emergence of something called delta T annealing. Many artists working with glass were first introduced to the concept of delta T annealing when, at the 1997 gas conference, Dan Watson from the Stewart Observatory Mirror Laboratory in Arizona presented a talk titled Practical Annealing, in which he described the monitoring of temperatures at or close to the glass at multiple points throughout a kiln during the firing process. The Bullseye Research and Education team began using Delta T annealing on large projects in about 2001 and have escalated its use to a wide range of projects since then. And this brings us back to Bullseye's annealing chart. It was derived in part from McClelland and Shand, but it's important for you to understand that it is also based on practical tests, which consisted of trials using a 3-inch thick block of glass with a thermocouple embedded in the middle as well as two thermocouples touching the top and bottom of the glass respectively. These thermocouples exhibited less than a 10 degrees Fahrenheit, 5 degrees Celsius temperature difference throughout the cooling rate given in the chart, and the glass showed little residual strain when viewed through polarized light. Sometimes such a block of glass with embedded thermocouples is actually included in a firing with works of the same thickness as a witness that provides a good indication of the likely temperature conditions within the actual works that one is trying to make. The same basic premise can also be applied to a section of glass without embedding a thermocouple in the center of it by monitoring it at several points as suggested in this illustration. When a temperature difference of more than 10 degrees Fahrenheit, 5 degrees Celsius, between the top and bottom thermocouples, which are the most commonly selected areas for measurement, or any of the thermocouples that are measuring the temperature of the glass itself is observed during annealing, the firing schedule can be slowed down to decrease this difference. Alternatively, if the kiln allows for independent control of elements in the different zones, such as top, sides, and bottom, these can be adjusted until the difference is corrected and subsides. If a temperature difference of more than 10 degrees Fahrenheit, 5 degrees Celsius, develops during the anneal cooling phase, the glass will develop annealing strain that will be present in the finished work and will only be relieved if the piece is properly re-annealed or the piece fails, breaks. Some annealing strain may be acceptable. Some of you may find some of this material familiar. Others of you may be hoping that I'm going to present something that's a little more exciting. So, I have some news. Yes, that's right. We're lowering the recommended anneal soak temperature. Why the change? For several years, we have used the new 900 degrees Fahrenheit, 482 degrees Celsius soak temperature for everything from simple fused pieces to large-scale castings with tremendous success. We now consider it more practical than 960 degrees Fahrenheit, 516 degrees Celsius, especially on larger, thicker projects, for two reasons. It's more efficient. 
it takes less time to cool over a shorter span of temperature. It's more effective. After the stress has been relieved by holding the glass at an anneal soak temperature of 900 degrees Fahrenheit, 482 degrees Celsius, the glass cools over a shorter span of temperature in which annealing stress could be introduced than it would be if held at 960 degrees Fahrenheit, 516 degrees Celsius. So, what about all that work that you've got out there in which you perform the anneal soak at 960 degrees Fahrenheit, 516 degrees Celsius? Don't worry. Effective annealing can be accomplished when the anneal soak is performed at 960 degrees Fahrenheit, 516 degrees Celsius. It just takes longer. The most important factor, however, is not the temperature at which one performs the anneal soak within reason but rather that one is able to achieve uniform temperature throughout the body of glass during the anneal soak and subsequently cool the glass in such a manner that it does not develop more than a 10 degrees Fahrenheit, 5 degrees Celsius temperature difference throughout the body of glass during the first anneal cool to 800 degrees Fahrenheit, 427 degrees Celsius. One can find out much more about the topic of monitoring temperatures for successful annealing in Bullseye's Tech Note 7, Monitoring Kiln Temperatures for Successful Annealing. To illustrate the points that I've made, I'm going to show you a series of tests completed over the last several years in which we were trying to find the ideal anneal soak temperature and time. Among the first of these tests was simply to fire one inch thick blocks of test glass under ideal conditions in the same kiln and vary only the temperature at which the anneal soak was performed. We then viewed and photographed the blocks through cross-polarized light to record a visual reference point of comparison for the residual annealing stress. As you can see, with the possible exception of the soak at 850 degrees Fahrenheit, 454 degrees Celsius, all of the blocks seem quite similar. Notably, all of them show some stress, which is not surprising if you note the delta T values that were recorded by top and bottom thermocouples during the anneal cool. We decided to pursue 900 degrees Fahrenheit, 482 degrees Celsius further, in large part because this is close to the strain point of our 1101 clear glass, as identified by the ASTM C336 test and much of what we were reading indicated that it would be more effective to perform the anneal soak closer to the strain point. So we tried to soak at 900 degrees Fahrenheit, 482 degrees Celsius, for a variety of different times, ranging from the same amount of time that we would normally soak at 960 degrees Fahrenheit, 516 degrees Celsius, to one-fourth that amount, to four times that amount. As you can see, we saw almost no difference between the samples, and if anything, it almost looks like soaking longer resulted in slightly more strain. So, what gives? The elephant in the room is the Delta T. As you can see, the longer we held the kiln at this temperature, the greater the Delta T became. This has everything to do with the type of kiln and the way the piece was set up within the chamber. Kiln P8 is a Paragon GL24 with elements in the top, sides, and door. You can see from this image that a test block as well as a witness block are sitting atop a 5 8 inch, 1.6 centimeter, thick malite shelf. In reviewing thermocouple data collected by the pyrometer for pieces fired in this situation, we consistently found that the bottom was running colder than the top of the glass, and that the longer we held at the anneal soak temperature, the greater this difference became. I point this out because it is typical practice to fire more slowly when one believes that the glass is not of uniform temperature. In many cases that may work, but in this case, firing more slowly, or for a longer period of time, exacerbated the problem instead of correcting it. The first correction that we attempted was to elevate the shelf in order to promote better heat circulation under the shelf. As you can see, there was a minor improvement in delta T, but the stress appears to be about the same. 
The next correction that we attempted was to bring the shelf back to its original height and then add a 1 inch 2.5 centimeter thick fiberboard on top of the mullite shelf. The idea was that the insulating properties of the fiberboard would keep the bottom from cooling too rapidly. As you can see, this greatly reduced the delta T and as a result, the residual stress in the glass. This made it clear that the delta T was the most important factor. In this case, the fiberboard allowed us to reduce delta T significantly, but obviously this is not a solution that is practical or scalable to other thicknesses of glass. In other words, the inclusion of fiberboard would not provide us with much control over the delta T. It is a static adjustment as opposed to being an adjustment with greater dynamic potential. Our next step was to run our test in a kiln with elements in the bottom as well as the top and sides, in which the bottom could be controlled separately from the top and sides if necessary. Please note that this test is set up on a mullite shelf alone, as opposed to the previous test, which was fired on a fiberboard atop a mullite shelf. As you can see, the results both in terms of delta T and its corollary of residual stress are greatly improved in this condition. The other elephant in the room with all of this is, how much stress is too much? Again, I'll defer to Dan Watson, who provided an answer to this question in Tucson. In the 1997 Gas Conference Journal, he wrote, A very good anneal will leave less than 100 pounds per square inch of stress. He went on to say, Stresses can become dangerous as they approach and exceed the 1,000 PSI range. I've shown you images documenting the residual stress caused by strain in the annealing range in a number of tests, but how much stress are they under? Watson proposed an equation that is based on Hooke's law, by which one could predict the stress in a final piece. Stress equals E, or Young's modulus, times alpha, the COE of the test glass, times delta T. Young's modulus for a common soda-lime glass is 10.2 times 10 to the sixth power, or 10,200,000 psi. Alpha, which is the coefficient of thermal expansion, for which I'll suggest a generic value of 9 times 10 to the negative sixth power, or 9 millionths, and the delta T in degrees Celsius, as measured during the anneal cool, assuming that the glass had been brought to thermal uniformity during the anneal soak. Let's consider the three samples here. If I use the equation and suggested values to solve for stress in each of these 1 inch, 2.5 centimeter thick blocks, I get 156 psi for a block with a delta T of 3 degrees Fahrenheit, 1.7 degrees Celsius, 532 psi for a block with a delta T of 10.5 degrees Fahrenheit, 5.8 degrees Celsius, and 4,590 psi for a block with a delta T of 50 degrees Fahrenheit, 28 degrees Celsius. Notice that at a delta T of 50 degrees Fahrenheit, 28 degrees Celsius, the stress as viewed through polarized light shows quite a fair amount of color. Generally speaking, if one views a work through polarized light and sees color, the piece is very stressed and is likely to fail. For the sake of comparison, I wanted to put a sample that is nearly the 1,000 psi of stress that Watson described as dangerous next to the much more stress sample at 4,590 psi on the right. Notice how in the sample that is more stressed, the color has begun to express as a rainbow. Intense rainbows of color indicate a glass that is likely to fail. While the equation provided by Watson is useful in predicting stress, it assumes some ideal conditions, including that Young's modulus is constant throughout the cooling range, for instance. Taking the time to look at the glass through cross-polarized light is going to tell you what you've actually got. So, if you set up the piece in such a fashion that it can be brought to a uniform temperature during the anneal soak, whether that's at 960 degrees Fahrenheit, 516 degrees Celsius, or 900 degrees Fahrenheit, 482 degrees Celsius, and cooled with a very small delta T through the annealing range, you should end up with a piece of glass that is under very little strain, and therefore has very little stress. 
That is how you take the stress out of glass. Thank you.